Thank you, Chair, for the introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to thank the organizers for their kind invitation to participate in this Congress. This is a nice picture, and I think I would like to use it as the background for my presentation. I'm going to talk about ultrasound-guided biopsy of the breast and axilla. But I would like to show you the fantastic paintings by Diego Velázquez, probably one of the best, if not the best, Spanish painter who was born in Seville, 1599. He became renowned for his realistic, complex paintings, paying attention to very small details, so probably he would have been a very good breast radiologist. Three periods can be considered, Madrid, Italian, and the return to Spain, and finally he died in 1660. These are the tools for a painter. And these are the tools we have for performing breast biopsies. So, the first question is, which biopsy device is the best for you? Answer A, fine needle aspiration. Answer B, 14 gauge core needle biopsy. Answer C, vacuum assisted biopsy. D, radio frequency excisional systems, and D, E. All of them can be the best in some specific situations. Please vote. You have 15 seconds. Can we see the results? Okay, I think it's E. I totally agree. All of them can be the best in some okay. specific situations. For instance, for a cyst, we only need a fine needle. For most, for most uh, solid masses, also some guy, the core needle biopsy is the choice. And for very small lesions, B3 lesions, perhaps vacuum-assisted biopsy devices are the best. This is due to the variety of lesions that can be seen on pathology of the breast. But we have three guiding methods to, to be used with the previous techniques. And we have to know how to choose both the optimal biopsy device and the guiding technique. So we move to my second question. What is the most important question in order to choose both the optimal biopsy device and the guidance system. A, is the lesion a cluster of calcifications or a non-calcified lesion? B, is the lesion visible on a stereotactic unit? C, is it palpable or not? D, is the lesion smaller than five millimeters? And E, is the lesion visible on ultrasound? Please vote. Can we see the results? Okay, I totally agree with you. Regarding the first option, is a lesion a cluster of calcifications? Well, it's important because most clusters of calcifications, the biopsy is performed under, uh, under stereotactic uh, uh, guidance, but we can detect some uh, microcalcifications with ultrasound. So we can perform biopsies under stereotactic and ultrasound guidance for microclassifications. Regarding the second question, well, it's a good question, but it is not the most important. Regarding palpation, it's also important, but I really think that uh, ultrasound guided biopsies should be performed uh, for palpable lesions. You can graph the lesion with your fingers. It's much better than without ultrasound guidance. Regarding the, the five millimeter, well, it can be sometimes uh, useful, uh, a vacuum-assisted biopsy for very, very small lesions in order to, to get uh, reliable uh, specimens. And, of course, the last one was the most important for me because if the lesion is visible on ultrasound, then use ultrasound for guiding a biopsy. 
These are the reasons for the widespread use of ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. First, the control of the needle position in real time, enabling to remove specimens from different places and directions. Second, ultrasound equipments are more available than stereotactic or MRI units. The accessibility to difficult places as the axilla or near the nipple. The local anesthesia does not hide the lesion, even it can be used to move the mass to a more convenient location. Fifth, excellent comfort for patients and radiologists. Sixth, the breast is not compressed, and it's a cost-effective and fast technique. So we move to question three. It's a case. 68-year-old lady, previous invasive ductal carcinoma in the right breast three years ago, routine follow-up. These are the mammograms. If you compare with the previous one, there is a new appearing mass. It's a well-delimited mass. It is not very far from the scar. And this is ultrasound. So the question is, what to do next? A, follow-up. B, ultrasound-guided fat needle aspiration. C, ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. D, ultrasound-guided vacuum-assisted biopsy and E, surgical excision. Please vote. Okay, can we show the results? Okay, I totally agree. For me, the best option is ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. This is how we perform a core needle biopsy with a conventional true-cut needles. It's uh, useful to, to cover the probe with a plastic film in order to prevent the contact with blood. It's very, very simple. You only need a few things to perform a, an ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. This is how we perform. First, uh, we apply the local anesthesia and then we perform the procedure. As you know, it's performed in an outpatient setting with local anesthesia and using the freehand technique. We can see the pre-fire image and the post-fire image, and we have full control of the needle position in real time. This is really important. But uh, two-cut needles have a dead space, so you must be aware of this because the sample chamber is not just in the tip of the needle, but several millimeters behind. So we move to a next case, case number four. It was a 14, 45 year old lady with a previous melanoma, and she came for routine follow up. You can see some lesions on this CT scan contrast enhanced CT scan, and two masses were confirmed on MRI. So the question is, what is your diagnosis? Fibroadenomas, complex cysts, multicentric invasive ductal cancer, metastasis from melanoma, or invasive lobular cancer? These are the images. Please vote. Okay, can we show the results, please? Yeah, absolutely agree. They were metastases from melanoma. This is the PET scan showing the two lesions, and this is the appearance on ultrasound, and this was the appearance after the biopsy, black specimens, typical of melanoma. Because the color is important. Usually, the white is better than the yellow, because yellow is fat. The consistency of the specimens is also very important. Hard specimens are better than, than soft. I mean for diagnosis, not for differentiating between benign and malignant. 
and the grade of immersion, the specimens that sink are usually better because they have less uh, fat. And how many specimens are necessary? According to these authors, four specimens if they are non-fragmented and they sink. But to be honest, I usually obtain no more than two or three if they are high quality specimens. And what is the best approach to deletion? As a general rule, use the shortest way from the skin to deletion. Always use an oblique approach as parallel to the probe and to the chest wall as possible. Try to avoid, of course, pneumothorax. And always try to use an approach through fat. For instance, in this case, for this mass, you can use the fat lobule as a highway. It's very easy to direct the needle through fat. But what to do in very dense breasts? You can use a 16-gauge needle because the shot is stronger. You can use a coaxial technique to insert the needle. Or you can use stronger devices, such as vacuum-assisted devices. The needle tip is very important. The second one is much better than the first one for dense breasts. And what to do in deeply located lesions? You can inject the local anesthetic to move the lesion to a more convenient location. And please use a parallel approach to the chest wall to avoid other problems. In this case, for instance, we can inject, apply the local anesthesia to move the lesion to a safer position. Or in this case, this lesion, and this is an breast implant, we can inject the local anesthesia to create more space here for security. And then we move to the next question. It was a 48-year-old lady that felt lump in her right breast one month before. And these are the mammograms, magnification views, you can see two clusters of pleomorphic microclassifications, both in the MLO views and CC views. So, the next question is, what to do next? A, follow-up. B, ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration. C, ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. D, ultrasound-guided vacuum-assisted biopsy or E, vacuum-assisted biopsy under stereotactic guidance. Please vote. Okay, can we show the results, please? Well, I, I don't agree. Don't forget that there was a palpable mass. Hmm? The best choice for a palpable mass is an ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. This was ultrasound. There was a huge mass, palpable mass. And ultrasound showed the palpable lesion as an irregular mass. Pathology was an invasive tactile cancer. So remember, for palpable lesions, ultrasound is very, very useful. And this was MRI, hmm? incredible. And can we perform a skin biopsy? Okay, the chocolate needle can be easily used as a punch. And if the skin is very thick, an ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy can be performed. I will show you some cases. You can use for a, an inflammatory breast cancer. You can use the, the chocolate needle as a punch and you obtain good material to the specimen, or for these recurrence, it's very easy. You only apply anesthesia and perform the punch with the, with the trucker needle. But if the lesion is bigger and you detect the lesion on ultrasound, you can direct the needle under ultrasound guidance to get the specimens. Well, Ultrasound guided core needle biopsy is an excellent technique. The results regarding sensitivity are very, very good. 95% of sensitivity. There are many studies on this topic. And in long term studies, 
the false negative rate is about 2.5%, which is acceptable. And it's really important imaging histological discordance that can be the clue to rescue some of the false positive cases. What are the complications of core needle biopsy under ultrasound? They are really infrequent and non-relevant complications. Hematoma or bleeding to present infection, very, very strange. Pneumothorax, almost impossible for an expert radiologist. And epithelial displacement can occur. Of course, you need the informed consent of the patient. Look, this is a hematoma after a biopsy. It was a pseudoaneurysm. I do not have the Doppler images, but this was a pseudoaneurysm, and posterior surgery, further surgery was performed. You can inject some uh, microfibrillary uh, collagen to prevent uh, the bleeding. And what about the epithelial displacement? Well, there are several articles. Most of them are very ancient, 1992, and it it really occurs. We move the cells from the epithelium to other part, but the conclusion of most of these uh, articles is that there is displacement, but these displaced cells do not seem to be viable, and there are no significant differences in recurrent recurrence rates if we use um, core needle biopsy, uh, surgical biopsy, or biopsy uh, by palpation. So it's a safe technique. Don't worry about that. But Cation, please do not introduce air bubbles when the anesthesia is injected. It's very important. Sometimes a hematoma can hide a very small lesion. That can be a problem. And pneumothorax is really infrequent. Of course, always use a parallel approach to the lesion. This is a case of bleeding. This is the initial lesion, and after the first biopsy, the lesion was obscured due to the hematoma. This can be a problem. Or be aware about air bubbles, hmm? because in this case, this is the lesion, and after the injection of anesthesia, perhaps you can miss the lesion. Be aware of air bubbles. And what about uh, microcalcifications? Is ultrasound guided core needle biopsy useful? Well, microcalcifications are rarely seen on ultrasound. Most biopsies for microcalcifications are guided by uh, stereotaxy, but ultrasound is useful to detect the invasive component of the tumor in extensive microcalcifications. But if the microcalcifications are not clearly identified, then try an stereotactic guidance. For instance, in this case, an extensive case of microcalcifications and mammography, you can detect perfectly these microcalcifications on ultrasound, so there is no need for and stereotactic uh, guidance. Please try first to do the biopsy with ultrasound, or in this case, an extensive case of microcalcifications. In this case, uh, ultrasound was uh, able to detect a very small solid mass that was the invasive component of the tumor, because the remaining microcalcifications were DCIS. We can perform a biopsy for a cluster of microcalcifications, in this case using a vacuum-assisted biopsy, we insert the needle below the cluster of microcalcifications, then we open the chamber, the aspiration, and we repeat several times until the cluster disappears. So, do we need vacuum assisted biopsy devices under ultrasound guidance? In this article, until 2003, the authors compare 181 core needle biopsies, conventional 14 gate, with 100 vacuum assisted biopsies. And they found no significant differences regarding false negative rate, underestimation, complications, and repeated biopsies. And why? Well, we know that most lesions detected on ultrasound are homogeneous masses. In other words, a small specimen is representative of the whole lesion. This is what happens with invasive cancers on fiber adenomas. Typical example of an invasive ductal cancer. Let's move to the next case, number six. 56 year old lady, she was asymptomatic. Recent ultrasound guided core needle biopsy with the result of papilloma. 
you can see here uh, circumscribed oval mass, both in mammography and ultrasound. So my question is what to do next? Follow up, MRI percutaneous excision using an ultrasound guided, uh, guided vacuum assisted biopsy, surgical excision and E, that means C and D are two, percutaneous excision and surgical excision. So please vote. Can we show the results, please? Yes, C and D are true for me too. Well, in this case, in this particular case, we perform an ultrasound guided core needle biopsy. It's a very safe uh, procedure. You can see the device, the specimens you obtain. And these are the images. You just insert the needle below the lesion and you remove it. It's very simple. And you can see the previous mammogram, and one year after the biopsy, only a very small scar can be detected. So, in my opinion, some of the B3 pathological lesions can be removed with using ultrasound-guided bi vacuum-assisted biopsies. Some radial scars and some papillomas. But be aware of ADH, lobular uh, neoplasias, and phyllodes tumor. So in my opinion, we can use vacuum-assisted biopsy as a second line after 14 gauge core biopsy with a B3 pathological result. Or we can use this technique as a first choice for architectural distortions, microcalcifications in an ultrasound or very small masses. And we can use this technique to remove benign palpable lesions, some fibroadenomas and papillomas, and sometimes to obtain huge specimens for clinical trials. Another example, this is a radial scar after core needle biopsy. This is the TOMO image. This is the procedure. The lesion was detected on ultrasound, the needle, and finally the lesion disappears. And the TOMO after the procedure, one month, one month later, the distortion is not here. There are some percutaneous excisional um, devices like this one, the BLESS system, op uh, operated with or using radio frequency. I do not have any experience with these, these devices. There are some publications, but uh, be aware of ADH again, because there can happen some uh, underestimation in 9.2% of the cases. And now we go to the axilla, a very interesting the axilla. So my question is, uh, which technique cannot be used to perform a percutaneous biopsy of suspicious axillary lymph nodes? Option A, ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration. Option B, ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy. C, prone stereotactic core needle biopsy. D, ultrasound-guided vacuum-assisted biopsy. And E, C, and D. Please vote. Okay, can we see the results? No, I think the only one we cannot use is prone stereotactic uh, corneal biopsy. Hmm? I don't agree. There is a lot of, uh, there are many articles on the topic about corneal biopsy for axillary lymph nodes. It's a safe, reliable technique. This is how we perform the technique. You have full control of the needle tip. This is a lymph node the pre-fire image and the post-fire image, very easy in this case, through the cortex of the lymph node. Other example, and this lesion in a, in a lymph node. Even we can use some vacuum-assisted devices for, for axillary lymph nodes, like in this example, I will show you, this is a suspicious lymph node. This is the needle tip. 
This is the lesion inside the chamber of the device, and finally, the lesion is removed, and you can obtain a very, very good specimen to analyze the lymph node with no important complications. But be aware of neuromas, hmm? because they are really painful and can be confused, confused with uh, lymph nodes. So, in conclusion, nowadays, ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy is the first choice to perform a biopsy for lesions visible on ultrasound. Vacuum-assisted biopsies under ultrasound guidance can be used as a second step after a B3 result or if the lesion is needed to be excised. And ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy can be performed for suspicious lymph nodes. Of course, you can use fine needle aspiration, but core needle biopsy is a good choice. And the last question is this one. Which one was not painted by Velázquez, please? Vote. Can we see the results? Yes. That's this me. is Saturn devouring his stone by Francisco de Goya y Lucientes. And I would like to finish with this quote by, by Velázquez, who said, I would rather be the first painter of common things than the second one in higher art. I can say that I would rather be the first or the best radiologist for the common lesions than the second one for the very complex or strange lesions. And remember this, ultrasound-guided core needle biopsy is really helpful for the usual lesions we can see every day. Thank you very much for your attention.